The West Winds Breviary is our gift to you during the shelter in place order concerning COVID 19. We offer you hope and healing as lovers and followers of Jesus Christ, believing these short online liturgies will elevate your spirits and unify your homes. May God bless you richly as you endeavor to renew your mind and love your neighbor. Hey church, thanks for being with us tonight. Why are we clinging to the patterns that fail us, harm us, and kill us? Genesis chapter 14, although before I read the scripture, I just, I just wanna ask you a couple of questions. Um, I want you to consider, if I say the words bread and wine, what comes to your mind? If I say the words tithes and offering, what comes to your mind? If I say Prince of Peace, what comes to your mind? Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. There is much scholarly debate, both within Christendom and rabbinical Judaism, about the identity of Melchizedek. Later on in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the first priest to ever appear in the Bible. We're told he's a priest of God Most High. But the reason I ask you those introductory questions is because it, it only takes a tiny little bit of scratching at the surface to, to understand that Mel Melchizedek is a figure of some significance. His name, Melchizedek, it means king of gods. Does that sound at all familiar? He comes from the valley of Salem, which is the Hebrew word for peace. So he comes from the land of peace. He is the king of peace. He comes to Abram and he offers bread and wine, and then he receives tithes and offerings. Is, is Melchizedek a priest? Or, or is he perhaps something more? Now, who could say? Right? It's uh, what we call good pipe and bar talk. You want to sit around with your friends. You want to ask yourself, is it possible that Melchizedek is, is a manifestation of God in the Old Testament? A, a, a pre-Christological vision? Is it possible that Melchizedek is, is one of those angel of the Lord kind of moments in the Old Testament? M maybe. That's a fascinating set of questions. I don't know. W what I do know is somehow Abram encountered God either through a mediator, Melchizedek the priest, or through God himself as some sort of manifestation of God. Abraham encountered God in a way he totally didn't expect. And God often comes to us in ways we don't expect. That's why later on we're told that some people have even entertained angels without knowing it. I mean, we are surrounded by divine manifestations. God works through people. God shows up sometimes. God sends angels sometimes. God directs us by his spirit sometimes. God is everywhere and, and we don't want to miss him. We want to make sure that we are people of attentive spirituality. Like, we're paying attention. We're on the lookout for God because we know God is on the move in one way, shape, or form. So, real quick, here's three things that I think are so critical for us. Number one, um, always welcome people of peace. Abram didn't know Melchizedek. He didn't know who he was. He was an outsider at the very least. Like they weren't part of the same clan. They weren't part of the same tribe. We've got to learn how to welcome people who aren't part of the same clan and aren't part of the same tribe. We've got to learn how to welcome people of different political persuasions, ethnicities, people of different faith backgrounds. I mean, we, we've got to learn how to be civil and loving to Muslims, Hindus, atheists, to Arab Americans, African Americans, Anglo Americans. We've got to learn that we are one race of human beings made in the image and likeness of our creator. Some of us are going to be politically conservative. Some of us are going to be politically liberal. Some of us are going to be one color. Some of us are going to be another, but all of us belong to the same God. And so when somebody comes and they're speaking words of peace, they come from the land of peace, they are a person of peace, welcome them. Who cares what they look like? Who cares where they come from? If they come, if they come from peace, with peace, of peace, welcome them. If, if you want to see God, if you don't want to miss God as he manifests or appears in whatever way, shape, or form. Number two, it's always appropriate to receive a blessing. We get nervous sometimes when, when people from different backgrounds want, want to bless us. You know, I, I remember the first time I went to, Hindu, uh, to India, a Hindu priest wanted to bless me. And I was so nervous because I thought, well, I don't know what that means. 
like we're from a different religious background. I actually, at the time, didn't know a ton about Hinduism. I wasn't sure that the word blessing meant the same thing for them or for that guy in particular as it did for followers of Jesus. I, I was just really, really unsure. But remember, a blessing is an amplification of good things. And the good things that are in you are in there because of God. So when somebody blesses you, all they're saying is, in essence, may the good things that God has placed in you grow and flourish. So it's always appropriate to receive a blessing, even if the person that's blessing you is, uh, maybe not somebody that you would endorse, or maybe not somebody that you would enjoy. It's always appropriate to receive people of peace. It's always appropriate to receive a blessing. And it's always appropriate, lastly, to reciprocate and respond to a blessing with a gift. That's what Abraham was doing. This is the first mention of the tithe in the entire Bible. And what does he do? He's so struck by, by this, this person who's mediating the presence of God or, or arguably housing the presence of God that he gives him a tenth of everything he owns spontaneously. There's no rule for it. There's no law for it. He just sort of issues forth in this abundant display uh, of, of generosity and friendship, th this massive gift, man. Usually when we give gifts, they're like $5 gift cards to Meyer. Maybe it's a little coupon around Halloween to one of those crummy McDonald's drinks. I mean, I mean, we are so stingy. But the truth is, when people come laden with peace and eager to bless, the appropriate response from us back to them is a gift, a lavish, abundant, super spectacular gift. Because that's who we are as people made in the image and likeness of our creator. We're givers, we're blessers, and we're peacemakers in God's name and for God's glory. In tonight's teaching, we looked at the story of Abram and Melchizedek, which is the first instance of tithing in the Bible. The word tithe means to give a tenth, one tenth of all that you have to God. Now, it's common in churches to advocate tithing. And at West Winds, we don't usually talk about tithing. 
The old yarn is that Christian people should give one-tenth of all that they earn back to the church as a tithe. And the truth is this, tithing makes a good floor, but a bad ceiling. The Bible doesn't advocate giving like that. The Bible advocates far more lavish and generous giving. But we know that for many people, it's, it's just such a huge number to start with 10% seems impossible. So many people don't give at all. Here's my best and practical advice. You want to have as an end goal for your life, an open and generous spirit where you give and give and give and give to God, to God's people, to God's projects, to God's church, to God's creation. But you have to start somewhere. So start by assigning a percentage of what you earn to God. Maybe that starts as 1% or half a percent. I, I don't know. I, it doesn't matter to me. It should matter to you because it's your money and you're earning. And then incrementally increase that percentage over time. During tax time or when you get your tax return, that's a good time to think about it so that you would go from 1% to the following year 2% or maybe to 5% or whatever. And, and go and progressively become a more generous person over time. That's a discipline you won't regret and that's an investment that will never sour because you're contributing to God and saying thank you in practical, simple ways that tether your prosperity to a sense of God's faithfulness to you. And I can tell you from personal experience, God is always going to take care of you. God comes in disguise, wondering if we'll perceive camouflaged glory. To those who are successful, much blessing will be bestowed. Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. May the spirit of Jesus raise you up, make you strong, make you bold, and give you hope.